welcome to pure experiences live streams in this series of live streams we are reading the mandukya karika by godapad which is a very well known text on advaita vedanta and it contains some commentary by shankar and anand giri also so let us dive into the text once again we are on the chapter 2 verse number 9 to 10 in dream also what is imagined within by the mind is illusory and what is cognized outside by the mind appears to be real but in truth both these are known to be unreal similarly in the waking state also what is imagined within by the mind is illusory and what is experienced outside by the mind appears to be real but it, but in fact both should be rationally held to be unreal what has shankar what is shankar saying about this having refuted the contention of the opponent that there exists no similarity between objects of the waking state and the abnormal unusual objects seen in dream the text proceeds to point out the truth of the objects of waking state being unreal like those of dream in the in the dream state also those which are mere modifications of the mind cognized within are illusory for such internal internal objects vanish the moment after they are cognized in that very dream such objects as pot cognized by the mind and perceived by the sense organs eyes etc as existing outside are held to be real thus though all the dream experiences are without doubt known to be unreal yet they arrange themselves as real and unreal both kinds of objects in dream imagined by the mind internally and externally are found to be unreal similarly in the waking experience objects known as real and imaginary should be rationally held to be unreal objects internal and external are creations of the mind whether they be in dream or in the waking state other matters have already been explained anand giri has is adding here that this is another ground for proving the similarity of the dream and the waking states and the consequent unreality of the later it may be contended that in the waking state we make a distinction between real and unreal and that the latter corresponds to all dream objects to this the reply of the vedantist is in dreams also we make a distinction between real and unreal we see unreal objects in dream and feel surprised when pictures we are of which impression we consider unreal in dream itself therefore there exists a sense of distinction between the real and the unreal in the one state as in the other 
for a while the dream lasts to the dreamer not only are dream objects real but also is the dream state a waking one the whole of dream experiences is known to be illusory only from the waking standpoint similarly the whole of waking experiences including its so called subjective imaginations and objective realities is equally unreal from the standpoint of true knowledge so this is the bottom line here that uh, why do we make a distinction between real and unreal in the waking state because of a specific state of the intellect and a specific state of a uh, specific uh, amount of beliefs the presence of a specific uh, kind of beliefs what have we done in the waking state is that we have classified everything that comes through the senses as real in quotation and everything that does not come through the senses as unreal in quotation so it is an arbitrary class classification why why is it that only the things that can be perceived by senses are called unreal there is a reason because if we don't do that the survival will be affected however things such as pain and pleasure and hunger they are not sense through the external senses but we then forget about our class criteria and we classify them as real also because again they are important in survival but when we imagine some when we daydream we tend to classify it as unreal because sometimes do not have the most of the time they do not have any consequences for survival so the materialistic point of view is based on the need to survive it is not based on what is true what is not true just what helps in survival and what harms survival that is the criteria in materialism for calling something real or unreal and it is very limited and it is very simplistic when we examine carefully we see that in dream dream state also the dream self or the dream character is making this kind of distinctions when a tiger is chasing you in the dream you don't say oh it is unreal you run you wake up sweating anxious and fearful only after the waking set of beliefs only when the criteria of unreal and real that is being used in the waking state it is remembered when the mind is fully established in the waking state only then we classify the tiger that was chasing us as unreal and then we go back to sleep peacefully knowing fully well that well according to my criteria the tri tiger is was unreal so this is what is happening in an ignorant mind it is trapped in its own classification which comes out of necessity to remain alive when if if you wake up from the waking state also you will find that whatever you considered real here is also imaginary there is something very funny that uh, only the intellect and a conditioned intellect who has this kind of blind beliefs about what is real and unreal has this distinction of real and unreal the lower layers of the mind they do not distinguish between the sensory data and non sensory data for example if you are hungry and you imagine very delicious food your mouth will start watering your throat will prepare for swallowing and your stomach will be ready to digest this is because the lower layers do do not distinguish between what was imagined and what, what was presented to the eyes 
similarly a fantasy of your lover works it produces the lust it produces the required changes in the body the body becomes ready to mate it works even in imagination the lower layers have no idea what is real and what is unreal that is another clue i don't know whether it is mentioned in this karika somewhere but uh, you can find that things behave equally well when it is imagined when it is not imagined and i will not go into the very well known and scientific study about placebos all you need to do is hold a belief that the sugar pill is a medicine and the mind does the rest it cleans up the disease somehow there are many more phenomena that are very fringe that nobody wants to study and nobody wants to believe because they are so conditioned by the narrow materialistic beliefs which again and again proves that whatever you perceive in the waking state that is also mind created yes dreams are a faint kind of experience compared to the waking essentially they are the same experience they are all mind created so this there is this very funny uh, notion of outside and inside that is seen in the waking state in an ignorant mind an ignorant mind says that whatever is outside me is real whatever is inside me is unreal for example i can think anything and it is not going to have any consequence outside but that is not true <laughs> if you keep thinking negative thoughts if you are always angry jealous and um, hateful it will show up in the body not only that it will show up in the speech and then it has consequences something similar happens in the dream it, it is not totally different only that there are the consequences are less ordered so just like in the dream state there are there is no outside or inside really it is all inside or you can say it is all outside all the experience you can say is either totally inside or you can say it is totally outside but as soon as you draw a line it becomes a delusion of inside and outside there is no boundary called inside and outside verse 11 if the objects cognized in both the conditions of dream and of waking be illusory who cognizes all these illusory objects and who again imagines them this is probably the opponent that is asking imaginary opponent the opponent asks if the objects cognized in the waking uh, and dream states be devoid of reality who is the cognizer of these objects imagined by the mind both inside subjective and outside objective who is again their imaginer in short what is the support of memory and knowledge if you say none then we shall be led to the conclusion that there is nothing like atman or self so there is a question here anand giri says it is the subject or the ego is now you know translated as subject who remembering the past experiences has similar experiences in the present we can infer a subject only from the facts of memory and experience if experience and memory be unreal the subject also would be unreal or non existent this is a 
point which should be kept in mind while answering questions like these. If the self and the objective world be unreal, then all categories of experience, which is knower, known and knowledge, become mere illusion. And that is the same as believing in absolute nihilism in which the existence of even Atman or Self is denied. This contention is invalid. One cannot deny the existence of Atman. For one who refutes Atman, the knower, takes the position of Atman. Therefore, the theory of the non-existence of Atman cannot be admitted. So, uh, probably there it will be answered, but meanwhile Anandgiri is saying that please note that if there is no seer, then there, the, all that is seen becomes meaningless also. It is absolute nihilism, that there is nothing and it is directly in contradiction to our knowledge and our experience and the experience of everyone in general that there is not nothing it is not absolute nihilism yes there is there seems to be unreality there seems to be illusions there seems to be an emptiness that cannot be comprehended by the mind but it is not pure nothing because if there is pure nothing then the question whether it, there is nothing or something will not arise. There is a question that means there is an asker and there is a doubt, there is a ignorance. So uh, this is a solid, this is solid stuff. This is the fundamental which everybody should uh, ponder upon. There is experience, there is memory, subject, there is an Atman, there is a witness consciousness. There is no denying of it. Yes, you can endlessly argue about whether the experience is illusory or real depending on your own subjective and arbitrary criteria of what is real and what is unreal. And you can argue about the nature of the memory, whether it is fundamental or whether it is also illusion or whether it does not exist or whether it is made up of matter or something. But there is no denying that these are the fundamental entities in our existence. Atman, the self luminous, through the power of its his own Maya in, in himself, by himself, all the objects that the subject experiences within or without. He alone is the cognizer of the objects. This is the decision of the Vedanta. So, by the power of Vedanta, there is the Atman. So a word of this Dev comes, which means self-illumined. It is illumining everything, it's, it, whether it's outside, whether it's inside, whether it is dream, whether it is waking. Shankar is saying, the self-luminous Atman himself, by his own Maya, imagines in himself the different objects to be described hereafter. It is like the imagining of the snake, etc. in the rope. He himself cognizes them and as he has imagined them, there is no other substratum of knowledge and memory. The aim of Vedanta is to declare that knowledge and memory are not without 
support as the Buddhist nihilists maintain. I probably do not know what they maintain here, but um, the Vedanta is saying that Atman is the support, Atman is the substratum. I don't think the Buddhist nihilist says this, but they also do not say that emptiness is pure nothingness. They do not say this. So you can imagine that uh, there was a little bit of conflict going on between uh, and the Advait and Buddhism philosophies uh, at the time. And the self was the center of the um, disagreement here. So it totally depends on how you interpret all these things. But uh, Gaurapad has answered the previous question here that it is the Atman, it is the substratum. There is no other substratum for mind and memory and knowledge and experience. It is one and the cell, the same self-luminous Atman. It knows itself by its being itself. That is what means it means by self-luminous. It does not mean that it is emitting light or something. <laughs> and the light is light of consciousness. So Anand Giri is clarifying a little the self-luminosity of Atman is predicated from the relative standpoint. Objects otherwise insentient appear sentient on account of the conscious Atman pervading everywhere. So uh, these bodies and minds and whatever are actually insentient. They, they are just patterns in the memory but they look as if they are conscious and alive because of the consciousness that is behind them. There is no extra cosmic creator of the universe who like the potter is separate from his creation. The creation is the creator. The universe whether it is physical, non-physical, mental, imaginary, is self-organized, self-organized activity of the consciousness itself. There is nobody else apart from consciousness. It is that which witnesses and the act of witnessing also creates. The perception is the creation. It is not that there is a separate creator who has created a separate uh, world and there is a separate human with a separate consciousness who is watching the separate world. <laughs> that, is, that is a totally separate matter of uh, delusion. It is all imaginations. It is. A It is a story that ignorant minds have cooked up, not knowing their own nature, not knowing the nature of the existence. Anand Giri again says, when we look upon the creation as a fact and seek its cause, my or ignorance is pointed out as, a, as co a such cause. That is what I said. The Maya inherits in Brahman as viewed from the same causal standpoint. It is like the ignorance which inhering in the perceiver makes him see his own mind appearing as various dream objects. And the causal ignorance of the knowledge of the mind's act of imagining which makes Atman appear as manifested manifold is here called Maya. So whatever is being projected outside can be called as Maya or illusion. 
it looks as if it is separate and has its own exist independent existence apart from me the perceiver but upon closer examination this is seen as a illusion there is no actual creation it is an imagination due to perceiver's ignorance from the causal standpoint atman is both the i material and the efficient cause of the universe there is no inert matter or anything else separate from atman which has fashioned into the universe so all these are blind beliefs it is never seen so whatever is created whatever is imagined whatever to be perceiving it the intellect and all it is just all same mind one mind with different layers of self organization different layers of intelligence that is all there is it is all an illusion so agency associated with atman are, are not absolutely real it is not a causal relation actually that is what he is saying knowledge and memory categories of relative perception in here in atman and in the creator brahman and atman are identical so <laughs> that is what he is saying it is a inherent activity of the atman to project its own modulations and then the jeev is projected as soon as the jeev is projected it starts thinking that there is a difference between what is projected and what is perceiving the projections this is ignorance it cannot see the identity of the brahman and atman not unless it is pointed out by a teacher the illusory jeev ishwar and the world last as long as the ignorance lasts solipsism cannot be a charge cannot be a charge against vedanta for according to vedanta the ego is not the creator of the non ego they come into existence together one cannot exist without the other from the relative standpoint both ego and non ego are the products of the mentation of ishwar or the cosmic mind so we see um, glimpses of uh, the cosmic mind being defined as ishwara this is the definition that i usually take whenever there is a mention of ishwara uh, uh, in the context of he is the lord and he is the god and whatever that is that i think is either a mistranslation or a misunderstanding the ishwara is me seen as the cosmic mind there is no individual mind this is an illusion this is appearance whatever is is this this is the truth which is appearing as this then being isolated because of the sensory and um, bodily causes appears as a limited tiny mind hopefully the stream is going through
the lord atman with his mind turned outward variously imagines the diverse diverse objects such as sound etc which are already in his mind in the form of vasnas or sankalpas or desires the atman again with his mind turned within imagines in his mind various objects just like ideas and all shankar says how does he imagine the ideas it is described thus in the word vikroti means creates or imagines that is manifest in multiple form lord that is atman with his mind turned outward imagines in diverse forms various objects perceived in the outside world which exists only for the moment as long as that imagination lasts all being of the nature of subtle ideas vasnas in his mind are not uh, are not yet fully manifested similarly turning his mind within the lord imagines various ideas which are subjective prabhu in the text means the lord ishwara that is the atman so it is another name for uh, the ishwar the cosmic mind or the universal mind and it is same as the atman with um, taking a form uh, in uh, engaged in the activity of imagination imagination creates all experience and that is also the foundation of magic the word magic comes from imagination and all the practices in the field of the magic or occult or tantra are based on this idea they they originate from this idea that uh, uh, it is possible to alter one's experience simply by desiring in a particular way simply by the sankalp or intentions very very strong intentions because that is what is really happening when we perceive anything when we are having any other experience it is the atman with its sanskar and vasnas projecting an experience outside or sometimes inside the mental is not really inside or outside it everything is outside atman or you can say everything is inside one and the same thing there are no boundaries in that thing. so that is what anand giri is clearing up here the distinction of objects as internal and external is due to the association of the two organs of perception and namely mind and sense organs so sometimes the mind is also the human mind is also classified into another kind of organ it is the sixth organ which is perceiving the internal atmosphere the internal and internal environment in the mind non sensory perception is the mind there is the common understanding of the word mind but i do not use the mind like this <laughs> i have refined many things here it happened because people became lazy and start started calling all the subjective experience as mind it is not like this so he says when a mind alone is concerned we cognize internal objects when sense organs are associated with mind we perceive external objects or in other words the atman with the association of sense organs externalizes the internal ideas that is makes them appear as gross physical objects 
this division of externality and internality is not true it is all outside or it is all inside it is just a point of view or you can say blind belief everything is here and now simply because it is an output of the sense organs and not of the internal organs in the mind does not make them outside that does not make them external the sense organs and the body itself is in the mind it is it is itself an appearance so anandgiri goes on as a potter or a weaver in order to produce a pot or a cloth first of all imagines these in his mind and subsequently manifests them outside associating them with appropriate names and forms so also the great lord first of all conceives in his mind as an idea the external world to be and then projects it outside associating it with suitable means and forms so it is very poetic here not to be taken literally just like many people in the magical field do they take it literally oh atman is doing is doing it i am the atman so i can do it no this tiny whiny jeev <laughs> cannot do anything it is done it is a result of doing it is a product it is not the source the source is doing whatever it does actually it is not doing anything it is simply perceiving whatever appears the waves appears in the pond the pond does not do anything to make them appear it simply beholds so but it is not totally um impossible to alter the experience as we know we can we do it in a gross way but there are there are refinements of this thing the more control you get over this process of creation perception projection the more control you gain over the experience that appears so it is a big field in itself the field of occult i am not going to go there today but i have already commented in many places how to do that how to become a real magician first gain the knowledge of the mind hack into the process of maya and then you are the atman yes all the Uh, desires vasnas and sankalps they belong to you so why not change it do anything you want but it is not possible to do it while being ignorant while remaining a puny human it does not know anything other than eating sleeping and reproducing <laughs> you need to rise above the human progress beyond your limitations and then nothing is unlimited and actually those who progress beyond they don't see any need to change anything it is perfect as it is and then he says the world that is seen extended in space and space and time time and space with its permanent and impermanent objects as well as the various ideas which are distinguished from matter are nothing but ideas in the mind of the creator that is atman as ishwar so this atman or the causal self creates by its imagination the ego and the non ego as well as their mutual relationship so whenever this word comes up it is understood as the creator the universal mind is the creator we say and where is the creation this the mind itself is the creation whatever we are seeing around us right now 
your room the trees the gardens the people it is all ishwar including your own body and your own mind the creation is the creator it is not separate and the essence of the ishwar is atman i am the ishwar the delusion that i am separate comes there because of the identification with an experience such as the body the word imagination is used as equivalent of kalpana the english term is generally used to denote a mental construction of the individual soul or self the sanskrit term applies to both that which is the atman and the individual soul so a little bit of clarification here the word kalpana is being used in many of these verses so here evam kalpayate prabhu and this word has a very deep meaning about which we'll talk later probably the kalp and the vikalp and these these things they form a very different philosophy in itself actually it is a subject matter of a totally different philosophy this should not be taken lightly as you know airy fairy imaginations of this human being you no know, it is it is something very deep it is magical number 14 those that are cognized within only as long as the thought of them last as well as those that are perceived by the senses and that conform to two points of time are all mere imaginations there is no other ground for differentiating the one from the other so shankar has a big comment here a doubt is raised as to the statement that everything is mere imagination of mind like a dream obviously this, this is very very doubtful <laughs> for the imagination of mind such as desire etc determined by mind is different from objects per to exist outside on account of the latter being by two points in time what is the two point in time past and present and future probably this objection is not valid objects perceived to uh, exist within only as long as the thought about them lasts probably means they last as long as the thought lasts which is our experience the thought lasts as long as the thought lasts and uh, the imagination also lasts as long as the imagination lasts it means they are impermanent signify those subjective ideas which are only determined by mind that is such such objects have no other time to determine them except that wherein the idea in the mind exists when imagining such ideas a very cryptic very very convoluted sentences here and he simply means that the thoughts and imaginations do not last beyond or before they exist as a mental activity there is no separate existence of them okay the meaning is that such subjective ideas are experienced at a time when they are imagined yes this is more clear they do not exist while they are not being imagined objects related to two points of time signify those external objects which are cognizable by others at some other point of time 
and which cognize the latter in their turn. Therefore, such objects are said to be mutually limited by one another. As for example, when it is said that he remains till the cow is milked, the statement means the cow is milked as long as he remains and he remains as long as the cow is milked. A similar in instance is the following. It is like that. That is like this. In this way, the objects perceived to exist outside mutually determine one another. Therefore, they are known as Davyakhala, that is Dvikala. I am sorry about this. Here is the proper Sanskrit word Dvikala, that means existing at two times, that is related to two points in time. Ideas perceived within and existing as long as the mind that cognizes them lasts as well as the external objects related to two points in time are all mere imaginations. The peculiar characteristic of uh, being related to two points in time of the objects that are perceived to exist outside is not due to any other cause except their being imagined by the mind. Therefore, the illustration of dream will applies here. So before I comment, uh, because this is a very technical issue here, and the, and the question is that uh, the mental objects, they remain as long as they are being cognized, but the physical objects then their cognition and therefore they cannot be equal to the mental objects they cannot be imaginary they cannot be mind created this is the objection here so he is trying to solve it he is trying to answer it so anandgiri says uh, there is a doubt that is the imaginary objects exist only as long as the mind that imagine them last and they have no existence beyond that time but the external objects that are perceived in the waking state exist at other times also even when the mind does not imagine them therefore external objects cannot be proved to be illusory by the mere illustration of dream experiences so again a restatement of the problem here in the mental imagination has no corresponding reality existing outside. Such an idea as the objective illusion of the snake in the rope created within by the mind is of the nature of mind and is perceived to exist within the mind alone. Such ideas exist only as long as the perceiving mind exists. They cannot be proven to exist by any other instrument of knowledge. So he is arriving at that thing, refutation. But the different external objects are mutually cognized by one another from different points in time. In the consciousness that such objects exist does not depend upon the perceiving mind alone. Therefore, such objects cannot be of the same nature as dream or imaginary objects. So again, more explanation of the problem. External objects are perceived by other minds existing previous to or subsequent to the present perceiving mind. Okay, this is <laughs> the whole um, essence of um, the belief that there is a material world outside which is independent of the mind, isn't it?
so it is very interesting he goes on the two external objects of cognition for example the milking of a cow and the remaining of a man are mutually related to each other in respect of two points in time the cow may be milked independently of a man's existence may exist independently of the milking of the cow those objects that are in this manner mutually cognized are said to answer said to answer to the two point in time so uh, it's not very clear it is very very muddy here so we'll try to decipher what he's saying it's cow and milk issue so uh, as long as uh, pot serves a purpose so long it is said to exist here also the time is the limiting factor thus all objects that are perceived to exist outside are determined by the present or any other time they are independent of the mind of the perceiver they are rather dependent upon the time in which they exist exist independently of the perceiving mind is also an idea that the world existed before i was born or will continue to exist after i die or that many things exist at present of which i am not conscious these are all mere ideas in the mind at the present time past present and future are nothing but ideas present in the mind at the moment so this is the argument that many idealists are going to throw when confronted with this problem that is that we are reflecting upon this can be better understood from the analogy of a dream of the dream a man may dream for 5 minutes in which time he may see objects ex existing during as many years different objects perceived in dream answering to different points in time are but the imagination of the dreamer who only dreams for a few moments similarly in the waking state a man by mere force of imagination sees objects conforming to different points in time extending over hundreds of years though from the waking standpoint dream objects are known to be illusory yet they are perceived to be actually existing at the time of dream similarly it is quite reasonable to believe in the illusory nature of the waking experience from the standpoint of truth there is no difference between the objects perceived in dream and waking states on account of their possessing a common feature namely capability of being seen so this was established before that this common feature leads to the equivalence of the dreaming and waking state that is established now the two points of time that is this is this is the problem and this can be solved by seeing that uh, the past present and future are illusory there is no time when it is past and there is no time when it is future the cognition always happens in present this is the only thing that is present in the form of a conscious experience so things do not exist when they are not being perceived although the memory can give us an impression that uh, the same thing existed before it was perceived by somebody else 
but this hole conclusion that is being um, derived out of this memory is happening in present yes it is very convoluted this is <laughs> the the mind is so entangled in the time that it is very difficult to understand this point of view and that is why we say that vedanta is very difficult advaita is, is probably the most difficult philosophy on this planet it needs the constant reflection and coming back to our present experience you cannot know it by words this is not a philosophy that can be read and understood so we have the statement of the problem for some paragraphs and then the solution is offered like this and he goes into the analogy of the dream also where you can see the different objects existing at different points in time and their time is totally manufactured it is not real time and also there will be other people in the dream who will say that yes the cow was there that i was milking the cow and so on there will be objects at two points in time in dream also nothing really different happens in the dream and nothing really different happens in the waking also so just because there was a cognition at two points in the time does not prove that the objects exist independent of the mind that imagines them into existence i know it is kind of very difficult to grasp this thing <laughs> when you know that there are no past and future then this whole idea of there being two points in time is demolished and then the objection loses its steam so eh, this is very very difficult whatever shankar is saying so let me read it again those that are cognized within only as long as thought of them lasts as well as those that are perceived senses and that conform to the two points in time are all mere imaginations there is no other ground for difference the one from the other so this is the bottom line here that um, we do not find a suitable ground to differentiate that which exists only in one point uh, of time and that which at two points of time Oh, he this sentence can be the key sentence here objects perceived to exist within only as long as the thought us such objects have no other in mind them except that wherein the idea in the mind exists so you cannot find that unless there is an idea in the mind 
unless there is a there is already an idea about that object in the mind so there is uh, the object is already here there is an instance of that object in the mind similarly for the uh, objects that are considered outside they are not there when they are not being perceived there is no other instance of those objects if they are not already in the mind it does not matter if um, it is some other mind or it is some other time it is always the mind that is involved in uh, perceiving those objects perception is the creation of objects there are no real objects so there is only perception that is all can be said so it is a very debatable debatable point that i i will agree here those that exist within the mind as mere subjective imaginations and are known as the unmanifested as well as those that exist without in a manifested form perceive objects all are mere imaginations the difference lying only in the sense organs by means of which the latter are cognized so yes that is why sometimes the mind is called as a sense because it can sense the subject to experiences it is another sense organ so or you can say there are sense organs there are sensory structures in the mind that inform us of the activities of the mind the roots of this information that the informations take are different for the case of physical or the manifested objects the root taken is through the bodily senses then it becomes information it is modulated by the senses and arrives in the mind and is cognized magically and uh, the means they take the root of the mental senses and then they are cognized that does not make them it is the same arising in the mind that is being perceived same thing yes their qualities are somewhat different but essentially it is uh, it is an activity of the mind only coming through two roots shankar is saying uh, though the objects perceived within as mere mental impressions are unmanifested and though the objects perceived outside through the sense organs such as eye are unknown as manifested gross entities yet the distinction is not due to anything substantial in the nature of the two kinds of objects for such distinction is seen in dreams as well what is then the cause of the distinction it is only due to the difference in the use of sense organs by means of which these objects are perceived hence it is established that the objects perceived in the waking state are as much imagination as those seen in the dream so we go to uh, this um, analogy of the dream once again
This happens in the dream also. There is a body, there are sense organs in the dream and there are objects that uh, are manifested in the dream. There are thoughts in the dream, there, there is uh, emotion in the dream but there is no difference between what is internal or subjective and what is external in the dream. They are coming from the same memory. Although there is a imagined or assumed distinction because some of the memory is being rooted through the mental uh, senses and some of the memory is being rooted through the senses on the dream body which are again mental. So this analogy will give you a bigger picture of what is happening in the waking state. There is a bigger mind and this body, uh, this individual body mind is appearing in that mind and some of the memory of the bigger mind is being perceived through uh, the senses, sense organs on the body but the body itself is being perceived, is being created from the same memory which is the Ishwar, which is the Vishwa consciousness only and the other uh, mental uh, events are coming through the same, same memory coming from the same memory but through different set of senses mental senses and that is why there is a need to create this concept of the mental senses just like we have the physical senses there are mental senses Otherwise, there was no possibility of uh, sensing the internal environment also. There was no possibility of sensing the pain, pleasure, hunger, balance in the body also. There is a continuation of senses from the finest to the grossest. What is our mistake is that we think the gross senses are the only senses. And therefore, whatever they tell us is the only reality. Here lies the ignorance. This is the root of the ignorance. Not knowing what the mind is produces this kind of ignorance about what is real, what is unreal, what is dream, what is imagined. So here we can stop today because uh, it is almost time for the Sunday Q&A session. So hopefully you enjoyed reading this um, Mandu Karika so far and will continue reading tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening.